there is a new book coming out called Res Responding to the Mormon Missionary Message, edited by Corey Miller and Ross Anderson. Corey and Ross have chapters in the book, but each chapter is written by a different author, and it's a neat book. Welcome, Ross and Corey. Tell us a little bit about yourselves. Introduce yourself. Ross, go ahead. Well, thanks. So, um, Ross Anderson here. I am a former Latter-day Saint, grew up in the Mormon Church, left Mormonism in my college years, and subsequently I've been a pastor in Utah for the last 40 plus years, and uh, we have some other ministry things that are going on regionally to help people who are leaving Mormonism to find a biblical uh, faith home and a church home. So that's a faith after Mormonism project, we call it. And so I'm trying to help uh, just any way I can to try to encourage people to you can uh, consider not throwing a baby out with the bathwater when they uh, find that Mormonism doesn't stack up. And my background uh, from Salt Lake City, Utah, raised as a seventh generation Mormon. So my ancestry goes back to the beginning, essentially. And then I uh, came to Christ in 1988, became a pastor, became a philosophy comparative religions professor, and now preside over a uh, nationwide campus apologetics evangelism ministry called Ratio Christi on over 100 college campuses. Could you guys tell me the story of how this book came to be? Why was it written? Who is it written for? Corey, it's Corey's idea, and Corey invited me to be involved, so I'm going to let him start with that answer. Well, I just think it uh, strategically, it made a lot of sense because the Mormon missionary uh, movement is really their growth model for the LDS church, and their focus is typically on those who have Christian backgrounds. And so they like to say an average Baptist church per week converts from the missionaries, whatever that means, but a whole lot of people coming in come from Christian churches. And instead of the, you know, the bleeding from Christian churches into Mormonism, why not give us the opportunity by God's grace to lead Mormon missionaries to Christ, go upstream and cut the Achilles tendon of that movement uh, and give them an opportunity. And the, the book reveals proof positive that Mormon missionaries are coming to Christ, and if a Mormon missionary comes to Christ, then his family can come to Christ, and it can cascade, and many others will come to Christ as well. And so I think it's strategic. This year, Aaron, uh, one of the apostles, recently said that uh, they will have upwards to 100,000 missionaries by the end of the year, and that includes their teaching missionaries and service missionaries both, but it's their largest arsenal ever. We thought that it looked like things were going bad after 2020 and COVID when everybody got nailed, uh, but they've rebounded in serious ways and have claimed that there's a 25% increase in baptismal converts already this year to last year. So it's absolutely unique, written by uh, former LDS missionaries targeting to reach current LDS missionaries and other LDS people, and at that point, uh, with that model, it's exponential and a cascading effect. Can you explain the significance of the Preach My Gospel book and why the book that you've written follows the structure of that manual? Yeah, Ross, do you want to take that one? Yeah, so the, yeah, Preach My Gospel was released by the LDS Church, the current version in 2004, I believe. So it's about 20 years but it's a manual for LDS missionaries to know how to do their job. There's a lot of information in Preach My Gospel uh, about uh, you know, how to make contacts and how to follow them up and, and how to prepare yourself personally for the mission. But embedded in the heart of Preach My Gospel are five lessons that, um, yeah, there, thanks, Corey, there it is. The five lessons that missionaries are taught to these are the core things that you want investigators to know in order to join the LDS church and so the very core narrative of Mormonism for its potential constituents 
is wrapped up in now there's a lot of esoterica that's not in preach my gospel because they're trying to reach beginners and people who you know are not necessarily scholars of mormonism or aficionados of mormon history and so forth so these are the things that are the most they that they deem as the most relevant and the most crucial issues that uh, people need to know in order to make a commitment to join the church Ross, you have the beginning chapter, I believe, and you talk about how Mormonism is just as much of a culture as it is a theological religion. Could you speak to that? And perhaps we could add another topic there. I'm really impressed by the diversity of authors that you have in the book. And it reminds me about, I'll need to define my terms here, but it reminds me about how Catholic our religion is with the lowercase c and how uh, united believers are across different cultures even different denominations different local churches um that the the bond the one lord one faith one baptism the gospel that we share is so uniting across cultures uh so yeah if you could speak to the, the mm -hmm. cultural homogeny and then the catholicity in contrast right that's a great point thanks for that opportunity so here's the thing. If you're a missionary that you were sent around the world to Thailand or to Romania or something like that, you would understand what the beliefs of Buddhism there are or secularism, communism, whatever, but you wouldn't stop there. You would try to understand the culture of the people who live there. Culture is the sum total of all the ways that we live and think. Culture is something we learn culture as a shorthand for life, basically, it's the things we don't even think about because they're ingrained in us by that, by how we were raised in our, in our context. So Mormonism has this, people have this cultural identity. A lot of Latter-day Saints have very little um, belief in the system of Mormonism, but they they would identify themselves as Mormons because that's their culture. But even these active, active Mormons that we're seeking to reach with this book or including missionaries, there's some elements of the Mormon culture that lead them to think and to act the way they do. And so I want to take that into account when I'm sharing the gospel, because how I share is, is going to be dictated to some extent by my culture, maybe my American evangelical culture um, or the California culture where I grew up. It's also going to be how they hear that is going to be dictated by their culture. For example, um mormonism in the culture of mormonism there's a sensitivity to persecution and there's a lot of reasons we could talk about why that that is but but if i come across to the lds person if it feels to them like i'm attacking them in any way um then they'll put up the persecution barrier now honestly um i've had that barrier go up when i have not been attacking because it's ingrained in their culture. And so there's a lot of cultural things to be aware of. And they try to touch on some of those in that chapter. But we do have a great cult, a great group. We do have within uh, evangelical culture in America, we have some great, uh, some great authors. They're, they're, they come from everywhere, all over the country, and they have a lot of variety of experiences. Some of them are have secular jobs. Some of them are in ministry, have been theologically trained. Some of them have been trained with uh, doctorates in other fields in in nuclear science and things like that and so we're we're blessed to have been able to put together this team that has this broad perspective but they also have this perspective that they lived the missionary life and what's interesting is each one of them shares how christians along the way affected their thinking how an interaction with a christian when they were a young missionary affected their thinking and left them a legacy. That's a great encouragement to us in writing this book. Ross, could you also speak to the importance of sharing truth, but packaged in the language of experience to Latter-day Saints? And if you could perhaps connect that to, um, I'll call it the joy of sharing stories that are packaged in the four gospels mm -hmm. yeah that's a great a great question because one of the things about mormon culture is that well two things about mormon culture is number one is their theology is based on stories they don't have a systematic theology their 
theology is embedded in stories and narratives of different kinds. That's how they learn what they what they believe. And so I want to be able to tell stories. I want to be able to tell the biblical story. And but I also want to tell my story because because Corey's chapter on testimony, we'll talk about that in a minute, I think, but he goes into the experiential nature of of uh, what validates truth. So there's this sense that I, because they are so experientially oriented and they feel like truth is going to be validated experientially by a story, by a feeling, then I want to be able to share my stories and how my heart has been touched by encounter with, with the living Lord Jesus Christ. Now, their testimony focuses on um, a response of they think certain truth claims are factual. My testimony includes that, but my testimony is also about how meaningful and how how life changing my experience with Jesus has been. So actually, I've just been meeting with Mormon missionaries, and they they ended it this week. They had to leave, go go to some other region, but so one of them is a really smart young kid. I think he's probably going to be a BYU professor someday. Who knows? Um, and so I find myself being in my conversations with him. We're, dr we're drifting toward deep theological questions and philosophical issues and stuff like that. My wife stopped me one day. She says, you know what? You need to, you need to stop the philosophical stuff. You need to just share with these guys uh, what your relationship with Jesus means to you. And that was a good note, a good word. And that, I think that speaks to the question that you asked. And finally, Ross, um, could you speak to the role of sharing Jesus stories from the four gospels in evangelism mm -hmm. to Mormons. Mm -hmm. So they, they believe in Jesus. They have a, that missionaries are going to have a high view of Jesus. They're going to come across really well, but they're going to frame every, everything about their story in the LDS narrative in, in the, the sense of like, okay, pre-existence and then creation and then earthly life and, and so forth. Um, but they have this, there's a, a sense of response. They respond to Jesus, I found. They respond to who he is. But so it's easy for me to abstract my view of Jesus and get on their turf in terms of talking about the big picture, Jesus is God or not, or he's always been God or he never would, you know, he became God. But, but the stories of the New Testament reveal Jesus to them personally. And there's there's a deep personal dimension to that. There's a deep sense of love. This is what Jesus actually said. We can talk about what we think Jesus said or what do we think it means. This is what he actually said. This is how he actually encountered people. And so it, it, it has a way, I think, of affecting their whole paradigm of thinking about uh, Jesus because they think about him in terms of their theological structure and this causes them to think more directly about who he actually is. One of the fruitful challenges that I've given teams that visit Utah is to obsess over one of the four gospels, say, for a whole year, and to develop such an intimate familiarity with one of the four gospels that you can use it as a, uh, a fallback, an appeal, a storyteller, a set of stories to tell when you're talking about any given major topic in your evangelism, not just with Latter-day Saints, but with anybody you encounter. Corey, I'd like to ask you about the three levels of authority in Mormonism and how that comes to play in your chapter. Sure. So for a Mormon, um, you know, Robert Millay, who was the dean over uh, the religious studies area and everything in BYU that students had to take, he oversaw 30,000 students. He said, authority is everything for Mormons. Authority is everything. Now, they've got prophetic authority and they've got a founding prophet who they highly revere. When I was growing up, I remember uh, walking through uh, church halls and I always remember seeing the size difference in proportion of the picture of Joseph Smith versus Jesus. I thought that was odd at the time, not that it's the case now, but back then when I was a child, I thought that was kind of interesting at the time. So they were very much revered Joseph Smith, but they revere all of their prophets and um, the living prophet 
takes precedence in some respects over other prophets, and that does raise questions, but there's the prophets, there's the modern revelation, then there is revelation uh, in terms of their scriptures, their, their quad, which is the uh, Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, the Pearl of Great Price, and the King James Bible, as far as it's translated correctly, which has implications to that. And then in addition to the prophets and the scriptures, you have the testimony. And I think um, for the average Mormon, that becomes one of the buck stoppers, really. That's, that carries uh, the authority. Um, Mormons are taught to seek a testimony, uh, what the Doctrine and Covenants might call the burning in the bosom, or Dolan Oaks, current apostle, uh, defines as a sense of serenity and peace. That existential encounter is sometimes what becomes the, the Teflon uh, to the Mormon's defense mechanisms. It becomes the greatest piece of proselytization in terms of potential of impacting investigators. Um, Mormons are, are sought or are, are taught to acquire a testimony. Uh, they're told to bear testimony frequently at testimony meetings. To fail in doing so is to fail in um, garnering merit points in heaven for this. Um, it's a defense mechanism when they're under fire. It's uh, an offensive, not, not being a jerk offensive, but in terms of advancing their cause. They do it often, and they try to get everybody else to do it often, too. You want to have the testimony. You want to gain a testimony. You don't want to lose your testimony. Everything is about that testimony, and that is for them. It doesn't matter oftentimes what a Christian shows to be an inconsistency in the Bible to the Book of Mormon or false prophecies or Joseph Smith history or something like that. Never mind the facts. I've got a feeling. And so Mormons are very um, experienced, feeling-driven people when it comes to religion, not to politics per se or, you know, logic or engineering. Uh, they're, they're great at, at all these other things, but I say that they've got a Kantian headache in that Immanuel Kant talked about the fact-value dichotomy, the, the division of faith and reason. They're very much uh, faith and feeling when it comes to religion. And so while the testimony is not an essential doctrine of Mormonism uh, that we need to deal with, and we should focus on essentials in our dialogue, it is, in my view, an essential of dialogue, because we're not going to get very far until we adequately deal with uh, and arrest that testimony and get them to uh, start doubting that to make room for truth. Corey, I remember from your chapter, you, you did talk about how for Christians, it's not that we're discounting the role of personal testimony. It's rather that we're perhaps, this is my own language, paraphrasing, that we're putting that in a concert of other sources of authority or evidence that uh, there's more, co we're not seeking a personal testimony at the expense of evidence. Could you speak to that? How for a Christian, there is a proper role in bearing one's testimony and talking about how God has uh, given us an internal testimony. Yeah, um, this is something I've given a lot of thought to. I tend to think a lot of Christians dismiss testimony and their witness to Mormons because they are so put off by the Mormon testimony being subjective. Uh, yet in my dissertation work on Aristotle and Maimonides and Aquinas in the history of philosophy that focuses on the knowledge of God, we Christians focus on the knowledge of God, and that doesn't mean just knowledge about God, right? Satan knows about God. He's maybe a great theologian, but that doesn't mean he's getting to heaven. There's a difference between knowing that God is present and knowing God's presence. So what does that mean to know God? And scripture tells us in, in Romans 8, 16, his spirit testifies to our spirit that we are children of God. Now we have to give an account of this. We see testimony throughout all of Scripture. It's used a lot. In, in mainstream philosophy, testimony is a major uh, subfield of knowledge, like perceptual knowledge is. Um, most of what we take ourselves to know is grounded in the testimony of others, expert testimony in a court of law and so forth. So testimony is legitimate. Uh, 
bearing testimony is fruitful for the Christian. And the Bible talks a lot about testimony as well. So what we're not discounting is the legitimacy of a subjective encounter with God. Um, there's a difference between knowing God, which is central to Christian experience. Jesus said it is the purpose of our life, John 17, 3, to know God. Um, there's a difference between knowing God and showing God. I run an apologetics ministry where we're concerned with showing God in the sense that we come up with evidences that are kind of publicly available in science and history and uh, nature and things like that. Um, but there is what Calvin and or Aquinas would have referred to as the sensus divinitatis, the sense of the divine, um, that the Holy Spirit, we have direct access to the Holy Spirit of God when he reveals himself to us. Now, the difference then, Aaron, between our subjective uh, testimony with God and the Mormons is that there, the problem there is that it is the sole criterion on which they often base their truth claim. Um, ours aligns the subjective testimony with the objective testimony of scripture, of nature, science, history, ethics, and so forth. Theirs does not have that. And to um, then show them the problem of this, I like to take the Mormon missionaries, the Mormons per se, and most males uh, who have been a Mormon for a long time have probably been missionaries as well, and increasingly females. But they're used to the story, as you and Ross were just talking about, the, the founding story, the, the grove, uh, where Joseph Smith went into the grove, and he was not sure which church to join. The Presbyterians wanted him, the Congregationalists, the Methodists, the Baptists. And as he recounts the story, he went into the forest and prayed based on what he took to be James 1, 5, to ask God for wisdom. And God told him to join none of them, and he's to restore the gospel, not reform, but restore it. And the Mormon knows that founding story well. So I set it up with what I call the police lineup, and I encourage them to consider, like the story of the Grove, how there were multiple different Protestant sects uh, which maps on to what the first missionary discussion is to create a need for a living prophet by showing a, a diverse and disagreeable set of Protestant sects and other religions. Um, you've got multiple different LDS rep or Mormon representation. Um, from the beginning, there has been over 400 splinter groups. And most Mormons aren't aware of that, but they are aware of the, the fundamentalists and, of course, the Salt Lake Church um, and the community of Christ and a few others. So I asked them, what if each one of those persons bore their testimony? And it included some of the essentials, like the Book of Mormon is the word of God, and that Joseph Smith is a prophet of God, and that the Church of Jesus Christ, what they're thinking of, and the Heavenly Father is a loving Heavenly Father, and, and Christ is my Savior. All of that common thread of elements in a testimony, and they all say the same thing. What that shows is at best, um, only one can be right because they all contradict each other, or at worst, they're all wrong. And so I say, do you think you're right? Yes. Do you think they're lying then? Are you judging them as liars? No, 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 no. Don't judge lest you be judged. So I said, but you do think they're deceived. Right. Yes, that's right. They're deceived. So it's possible to be deceived by a subjective testimony. Yes. And so how do you know you're not deceived? I want to put those pebbles in their shoes. I want them to always remember that story, that illustration, so that every time they bear testimony, they cannot forget the feeling when they realized that conundrum they were under. And it makes room for then the Christian to advance testimony in addition to biblical testimony. Corey, you shared something that's very usable and intelligible and practical in your chapter for believers in their discussions with Latter-day Saint missionaries. And it's the paragraph from 1 John 5, mm. where it says, if we, um, if we accept human testimony, um, well, I'm paraphrasing, we should look to God's testimony all the more. I have uh, found great delight 
in thinking about scripture as the publicly available divine testimony. I'd like to say it's as it's as though God got up behind the podium in a fast and testimony meeting and now God is bearing his testimony. Could you speak to that use of first John five? Yeah, 1 John 5, 9 through 13 is one of my favorite passages of all passages to use with Mormons uh, for a variety of reasons. Number one, it uses the word testimony no less than six times, more than any other place in scripture, you find it right there. And because that's a hallmark of what the, the Mormon is doing in their proselytizing efforts, uh, trying to get people to read the last book of the Book of Mormon, verse 4, uh, to pray over this and know that it's true. And then they, with great tenacity, bear testimony and often confuse tenacity with veracity or truth. Um, I want to then, after we've had plenty of time to discuss, and I've asked them lots of questions and allowed them to be in the position of teacher, I've now earned the right to be heard. And now it's my turn to bear testimony and pull out scripture's testimony to show that my subjective testimony maps onto the objective testimony of scripture. And it gets to one of the essential doctrines as well. Um, and that is, uh, this is the testimony of God about the matter. And that is he who has the son has the life. He who does not have the son of God does not have the life. Present tense, Jesus is enough. And then it says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may know that you have eternal life. Now, eternal life to a Mormon is the greatest of all gifts of God. That's spending eternity with Heavenly Father. And so um, for the Christian, of course, we know this just simply to be heaven. It's not three degrees of glory. But for them, eternal life connotes something very particular. Um, and I say, do you know without a doubt, right now, if you die, you would spend eternity with Heavenly Father. And if you don't, then your testimony does not map on to the objective testimony of Scripture. And that's because you're not trusting God. You're trusting in what you can bring to the table. And God says that's lying. One of the uh, neat things about this book is you've got a whole chapter in there by Micah Wilder. I'm not sure if people know who Micah Wilder is, but he is a man that God saved, I believe, on his LDS mission. Yeah. And hold, he, Aaron, hold on. It's actually Matt Wilder. So oh, Matt, Micah's brother. Matt Wilder. Yeah. Micah. Yeah. So both <laughs> both you. great stories. Both yep, great yep, stories. Yep, that's, that's and, good catch there. Yeah. I think yeah. I read this as though it was Micah. <laughs> so, well, yeah. Matt's great too. Um, Matt, Micah. If you're reading this, if you're hearing this, I love you guys. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, if I could, if I could, uh, tit for tat here, Corey, it's Robert Millet, not Millet. <laughs> right. You know, I, I always, you're, you're right about that. I grew up in Utah with a friend, uh, whose last name I always pronounced the other way. So I, I can't get that out yeah. of my <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you for the correction. Uh, my, Matt Wilder's chapter talks about a metaphor for a works based religion wherein one is trying to summit Mount Everest, uh, but it's a, it's a death wish for some people. They, mm -hmm. they, they get to the top and they're without oxygen. And he describes the relentless, hopeless, um, oh, the, the work, the climb upward toward perfectionism and trying to be uh, right with God and clean in your conscience according to a standard that you never can quite uh, reach. And that, I think that's, I know, we, know, we don't have time to discuss every chapter, but this chapter, I think really started for me uh, setting the tone in the book that the major, that the most prominent topic in this book, I think that this trains Christians to speak to is the issue of grace. Uh, and grace is, is a kind of gateway topic for that God used, his kindness leads us to repentance. Uh, grace is a prominent theme here. Could you speak to that a bit, uh, either of you? I think we both probably can. I can say existentially, that's what uh, made the difference for me when I first left Utah simply for a summer in California. 
and had a friend's dad say, you can spend all summer at the beach here, but you're going to have to go to this non-denominational Christian camp and I'll pay for it. So I thought, okay, no big deal. I got there. The speaker spoke on hell. I tell people that that, that scared the hell out of me and heaven <laughs> into me, but it was for the first time in my life. I mean, I was raised as a seventh generation Mormon. I was raised in the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I was supposed to have understood grace. I never encountered grace like that. And and it, it harkens back to what Calvin might call one of the you know third uses of the law, or Paul talks about it in, in Romans, um, that you know it was the law that brought about the knowledge of sin, um, and it made sin utterly sinful. And, and with that background, makes grace utterly graceful. Because I was confronted with the law, it really resonated in my heart. I knew I was a sinner, but I'd never been faced with it like that. And so I remember being snot-nosed, having tears running down. For the first time ever, I understood grace, and I saw it through people, but I heard the gospel for the very first time in my life. And that was so moving that I moved back, I went back to Utah at the end of the summer, packed my bags, and moved to California my junior year of high school to live with that family. My mom gave me permission to do that. Uh, but I was discipled there, and I just, it was a game changer. It wasn't, even though I, I've spent 35 years now in philosophy, comparative religions, and apologetics, it wasn't initially apologetics. It was grace uh, with the background of the law yeah. that showed God's love to me. That was moving. My, uh, my two favorite chapters in the book are by Paul Nurnberg hmm. and by Michael Forney. Uh, yeah. um, Paul's chapter grabbed me in an unexpected way because I, you guys are nerds and um you know <laughs> I, you, you set things up really quite well but his chapter took a kind of a different turn and it drew me in to this raw uh sharing of how sinful he discovered himself to be uh growing up and how much grace he needed it hmm. you could you could taste he's actually the, the biggest sinner in the book <laughs> you could you listening could, the uh <laughs> reminds me of luther's blunt uh speech yeah. about his own sin but it, it really grabbed me and pulled me in um and i i just i just really enjoyed that chapter in terms of you know to ross's point the, the power of stories paul's story when i when i got done with paul's chapter i thought i think that chapter alone was worth the book so if people wanted to go buy the book just for Paul's chapter, um, that I really enjoyed that. I, that was a side of Paul that I, you know, I've listened to a bit of him on his podcast, but that was a neat side of Paul. One thing that really disturbed me was how much from the preach my gospel manual, different authors in this book were able to quote from to show just how works-based the religion was just how stark and explicit and how lucid uh, preach my gospel is and teaching that in order for us to retain a remission of sins we need to keep the law uh, it's kind of this this uh obliviousness ness to the the the, uh, the the hopelessness of a law-based works-based system of achieving rightness with god uh the other chapter that i really enjoyed like i said was michael florney i also enjoyed uh eklund's chapter oh, anyway Good, good stuff. Yeah. Um, I, I thought that was the, the best chapter to end the book with. Mm. Uh, yeah, me chapter. too. Yeah, me too. I mean, and we didn't plan it that way. He just said, "Oh, we get." You know, he said, uh, "I'd like to take the fifth lesson of preach my gospel." And the more I've read that and mm. been over, I thought, you know, that really he really did finish really, really well. It's a, it's a great a great way to, to end the book. I, I thought the book might soft pedal a few things, you know, just trying to be super respectful. Sometimes some literature that engages Latter-day Saints does this, but I, I did not get the sense that any of these authors soft pedaled problems. And yet uh, I could feel the beseeching and the, the imploring yeah. and the kindness of the gospel mm -hmm. coming through Florney. Um, it just, it personally uh, blessed me. And I, I one one reason to read a book like this um, is obviously to prepare yourself to effectively share the gospel with your Latter-day Saint neighbors. 
but for me um the second reason the personal devotional practical reason to read books like this is it seems that god uses error to to point us back to the truth to mm -hmm. remind us of our need mm -hmm. for grace the need for truth so this same gospel that my mormon neighbors need i need and uh, Florney's presentation of Jesus, who is my proxy, he is my substitute, Jesus is my true temple. Uh, uh, Florney's uh, emphasis on the imputed righteousness of Christ, uh, and in contrast to the proxy work done in Neldius temples, it was so beautiful. And yeah. uh, it, I did not get the sense walking away from this book that. Uh, that ultimately there is an axe to grind what i got from this book was that there is a beautiful i'll call it a catholic but i'm using that word in a very technical mm -hmm. universal sense a shared i mean it not in the roman sense but in the the shared christian enjoyment of the gospel of grace uh the, the unity the one lord one faith one baptism we have i got the sense that that is ultimately what this book is aching for our mormon missionary friends to know yeah, yeah. A funny story. Yeah. So this is, I think I got this book. I had this before he even converted and I never even read it. Mm. And, um, you know, I was on unbelievable Briarly's program with Lynn Wilder talking about our book uh, and debating um, a Mormon scholar in the UK. I didn't know this at the time, but Lynn had debated Michael Flournoy <laughs> now on, on Justin Briarly's program. And this is called a biblical defense of Mormonism. This is what Michael wrote while a Mormon to be in a, Mor a Mormon apologist to lead Christians to Mormonism. And he got off that debate and his dad called him and said, boy, she squashed you, son, or something like that. <laughs> and he came away from there thinking, you know, there really isn't a biblical defense of Mormonism. <laughs> And so, yeah, this is uh, for these authors. This is this is real. It's not just theological. It's not academic. You know, these guys have uh, many of them have gone to seminary since earned PhDs, done pastoral ministry, have podcasts. They served full two year missionaries from coast to coast and around the world. And uh, they've met the living Jesus for the first time when they left Mormonism for Jesus. OK, I thought of one more comment to make. I got to meet, I've got to meet this guy, Neil Humphrey. <laughs> that guy's, uh, that guy's spicy. <laughs> yeah, he's an interesting guy. He lives in, he actually lives in Layton, Utah. And he was formerly the pastor of a church called Mountain Road Church, uh, Evangelical Presbyterian. Um, and he's retired now. So um, yeah, he, yeah, he's, I've known him for years and years. And he, his take is really, it's an interesting uh, sort of digression from some of the style of the other others, but his 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 chapter is good. Yeah, I think his emphasis was on the inappropriateness of the Mormon Church binding the conscience with yes. extra biblical requirements. Yeah, and that is absolutely uh, related to the heart of the gospel. It's what Paul deals with in, in the Book of Galatians, so it it deserves a fair hearing. Um, mm -hmm. but I was like, I've got to meet this guy. It sounds like he's got <laughs> a fun, electric, spicy personality. Oh, he's an interesting any, guy for sure. Any final comments from you, my friends, where, uh, when does the book become available and where can one order it? Well, it becomes a, comes the public release is August 15th. So, um, it's available for pre-order from the publisher which right now the pre-order, uh, before August 15th, there's a nice little pre-order discount from Anico Press is the publisher, A-N-E-K-O. And, um, and it's also pre-orderable on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Christian Book Distributors, a lot of the places where people normally buy books, it can be pre-ordered uh, at this point. Uh, Barnes & Noble and Amazon both have, you know, a Kindle quote version of it. And um, it's being translated into Spanish this next this fall. We're talking about, I'm not sure, Corey, how far this has gone along, but we're talking about an audio version of it that would probably come out Good. sometime next year, you know. So people, but people can go to wherever they go to get their books and uh, they could pre-order it until August 15th and then and it'll ship. And Ross, uh, just to add to that, uh, our website has 
an Enco on there for the discount. It's got Amazon on there. So if they go to Mormon Missionary Message, MMM, Mormon Missionary Message.com, you can learn about all the contributing authors. You can hear some of the uh, interviews, like maybe this one that we'll upload there. Um, and you can find out more about the book and the endorsements and things like that. Mormon, yeah, thank Aaron, you for your work. Yeah, I would just, I just close with this idea. Um, that really the book works on so many levels. It's not just the cognitive level. It's it's good at the level of facts and, and theology and apologetics. It's just good with that. But it's also, I think we've, I think our listeners have heard us say it's really a, a heart and and head together because the stories are powerful. It's going to encourage a person to actually invite the missionaries to talk to them to because they could see the stories of men that God's life has changed. And these missionaries give tips. They give practical stuff. So it's not just like comparative doctrine. There's some, a lot of really practical, uh, informative ways to approach those conversations. And everyone will be encouraged and inspired uh, by the stories that are told. It's, it's, gonna, it's a great book. My wife's enjoying it. She's not like super intellectual uh, cognitive. I'm enjoying it. I've been using it. Uh, when my meeting with these missionaries I've been meeting with, I go back to the book and say, okay, let's see what's in this chapter I didn't write. Let's see. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Let me remember to do that. And it's been great. I've been witnessing to Mormons for almost, I think, two decades now. And I was telling my wife this morning, I just really enjoyed it. I, you know, there's, there's a lot of literature out there helping Christians be trained to talk with Latter day Saints. Uh, but at the end of the day, I just genuinely enjoyed this book. And I'm, I'm thankful for God providing the community of people, the community of Christians that are engaging Mormons with uh, an ever maturing set of authors and editors mm -hmm. to do responsible apologetics and training. Thank you, brothers, for all your work. Thanks for allowing us to be on your yeah, program. Th thanks for hearing from us. You bet.